Good morning, TEDx. That's not bad, I know it's early. Well, welcome to my world, the world of audio branding. I'm gonna take you on a little journey with me this morning. Audio branding is where I have the privilege of traveling all over the world, working with global agencies and brands, helping them use a little science and a little art to transform sound into something that's designed to influence your behavior and shape your perceptions. So I'm gonna pull the curtain back on this a little bit and kind of let you hear and see a little bit about what's going on out there. Now, I started by playing a few things that we call audio mnemonics or audio logos. Now, you may have recognized some of those things. An audio logo is to your ear what a visual logo is to your eye. It's a set of sounds or notes that when you hear them, it triggers a memory of the brand that they're designed to represent. For instance, when you hear this, you probably think of this. And you wouldn't be alone because actually 90% of the world's population recognize those five notes as the Intel audio logo. But far more than just recognition, sound has the capacity to generate a physiological response. When you were listening to the beautiful music earlier this morning, there was dopamine that was being released in your brain. And in an experiment, 50 volunteers were selected and they were wired up to kind of measure the pupil, the galvanic and the brain wave responses to a series of sounds. So these sounds were played and then they were ranked based on the order of how intense the response was to the sound. So one of the sounds that they played was this. Where do you think that ranked in terms of a physiological response? Number two. In fact, the Intel audio logo had such a powerful response that there was only one sound that could actually beat it. <laughs> the sound of a baby crying. So, these sounds trigger associations, they trigger physiological responses, but, you know, what about behavior? That's a whole other thing. I mean, by listening to things, is that actually going to affect how we spend our money or how we purchase things? Well, let's go on a little journey, shall we? Feel like a bottle of wine? Let's head to the grocery store. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> let's head to the liquor store. So, we step inside, we head over to the wines, we see the French wines, we see the German wines. We stop for a moment, we look, ah, there's the one we want. We grab it, we head to the cashier. As we check out, the cashier starts to ask us some questions. Well, why did you choose that wine? Ah, we like the label, we like the color, we like the shape of the bottle. And then they say, did you happen to notice what was playing in the background? No, we didn't. Or maybe we did, but that didn't have any basis on our choice. And yet, in that particular experiment, the days that French music were playing, 77% of the wines that were sold were French. And if they switched it and played German music, 73% of the wines sold were German. You still don't think it has an effect? Let's take another trip. Let's go to Vegas. What do you hear? The coins dropping in the metal slots. The ratcheting as you're pulling the slot machine. The sounds, the beeps, the whistles, the buzzes. What would happen if all of that went away? I'll tell you what would happen. The money would go away with it. They found that if they took the sounds out of those machines, there was a 24% loss in revenue. Yeah, sound is really powerful and brands know that. And they're looking at more and more sophisticated ways to use sound. Here's a couple of really interesting examples. I'm gonna start with Dunkin' Donuts. 
Now, they did this uh, campaign in Seoul, Korea. So they started with atomizers. And then these little atomizers, they installed the smell of fresh brewed coffee. And then they took these atomizers and they installed them on public buses. Now, what was interesting was there was a sonic trigger for the atomizer. What that meant was whenever the Dunkin' Donuts commercial came on the radio, the audio mnemonic, that audio logo for Dunkin' Donuts, triggered the atomizer, and all of a sudden, you weren't just smelling coffee, you were also hearing Dunkin' Donuts. And if that wasn't enough, when you stepped off the bus, they hit you visually with photographs in the bus stops of hot, steaming coffee. You know what happened? In the Dunkin' Donuts around those bus stops, they saw a 16% increase in traffic and a 29% increase in coffee sales. Well, here's another example. This is a banana brand in New Zealand, all good. It's a fair trade banana. And their agency had the idea of using sound at point of sale. So in the supermarkets in the produce section where the bananas were, they put a floor decal with the logo and a simple phrase that said, listen to your conscience. Then they installed a speaker, but not just any speaker. This was a directional speaker that focuses the sound in a very narrow beam. And it focused it right down on that logo. And so when you stepped in it, all of a sudden, you heard a voice that seemed to be coming out of your head that said, psst, don't look around. Nobody else can hear me. <laughs> I see you looking at the bananas, trying to decide which one to buy. Well, this is your conscience. You need to buy all good, fair trade bananas. And people did. In fact, the first three weeks of that promotion, sales of all good fair trade bananas went up 130%. <laughs> so, so why is this? Why is sound so powerful? Well, one of the reasons is that we're actually wired for sound. You know, the audio circuitry in our brain is less dense than the visual system. And what that means is that sound gets routed very quickly to the precortical areas where emotions are, are generated. Think about it this way. You can hear things 20 to 100 times faster than you can see them. So that means sound has the potential to get in before all of your other senses and actually shape your perception of how they're working together. Now, nobody knows this more than a fellow by the name of Dr. Charles Spence. And Charles is head of the Crossmodal Research Laboratory at Oxford University. Charles spends his time taking a look at how our brain makes sense, literally, of our senses, and how all of these senses work together to form a unified perception of the world. Now, I've had the privilege of meeting Charles on quite a few occasions. I've visited his lab, I've spent some time with his students, and Charles has some really fascinating experiments. And one of the most interesting to me involved uh, an aerosol spray can. So, this can was given to a test subject in a soundproof booth, and they were told to depress the nozzle and listen to the sound. They had on headphones, there was a microphone there, so they did that, they listened to the sound. Charles asked them a series of questions. So, was the sound soft? Was it loud? Was it hard? Was it easy? Was it masculine? Was it feminine? And then he gave them another aerosol can, told them to do the same thing. Press it, listen to it, ask them the same questions. This happened again and again with different test subjects. Well. Everything in the experiment was the same. The cans were the same, the contents were the same, the nozzles were the same. The only thing that was different was there was an engineer in another room attenuating the frequencies so that as they heard it through the headphones, it was changing. The result of that experiment, the next time you're at the supermarket or the pharmacy, go to the deodorant aisle, look for the Axe deodorant spray. You know that black plastic top on the top that looks like it's a protector cap? That's actually designed to enhance and baffle certain frequencies of the sound to get the sound of the Axe deodorant spray closest to what they felt a consumer would want to associate with it. Oh yeah, this is going on a lot more than you know. 
Now, we've done a few experiments of ourselves, kind of, kind of looking at this cross-modal relationship. So here in Nashville, not too long ago, we worked with Etch Restaurant, and one of Charles's students from the lab, Janice Wang, and we wanted to see if sound could actually affect your perception of taste. And you know what we found? We found that if you were eating something and were listening to this, your perception of that food was that it would actually taste sweeter. And not only that, if we switched it up and played this, all of a sudden, oi, caliente. It was much spicier. So again, sound is powerful. So, why am I telling you all of this? Well, you know, it's not really because I want to launch into a diatribe about marketing and behavioral manipulation. I'd rather ask another question. How can we take this knowledge, these strategies, these tactics, and actually use them to maybe make the world a better place? How can we use sound to elevate, if you will, our experience of the world around us? Think about it. What are some of the behaviors or the actions that we would like to encourage? How about exercise? What if I could help you take the stairs more than the escalator beside it? They actually tried this in Stockholm, Sweden. Coming out of a subway, they put some pressure-sensitive pads on the stairs, painted them to look like a keyboard. You see what's happening? Yeah. As a result of this little experiment, they found that 66% of the people decided to use the stairs instead of the escalator. How about trash? They tried a similar thing with the trash bin. They loaded it with a sensor, with a sound effects loop, so that when you put your trash in, wait for it. Yeah. Well, you know what happened? In that particular trash bin, they collected 159 pounds of trash. That was 70 pounds more than the trash bin near it that didn't make any sound at all. How about making people more aware of a situation or a cause? To increase the awareness of the shrinking chestnut tree population in Berlin, Germany. They selected a large chestnut tree and they put underneath it these polymer structures that were designed to respond with light and sound when the chestnuts fell from the tree. So as these chestnuts fell, it was as if the tree was creating a musical performance. People were encouraged to come to participate and they were given a SMS code where they could text a donation. Well, as a result of this interesting use of sound, they had over 500 people a day that visited that installation. And the proceeds, the donations for that fund, went up 800%. What about public art? What if we could encourage people to discover and interact with public art? Well, we're actually doing a little experiment now here in Nashville to see if we can, can help with that. Metro Arts, back in 2015, with a grant from the Bonnaroo Foundation, commissioned a number of sound artists and composers to create audio works that were inspired by some of the public artwork around town. So working with another local company, Beacon, we've in installed these little signal devices around these artworks where if you have a Beacon app, you can go to the artwork, you open the browser, and then you're able to access this audio. So that not only can you see the art visually, but now you have the opportunity to experience it orally. And what you're hearing right now is one of those compositions by a composer named Christopher Farrell. And healthcare, this is a big one. 
This is one we're doing a lot of thinking about right now. You know, there's a lot of research that shows that sound has a real impact on patient outcomes. But how often are we thinking about that in the healthcare environment? How often is this our sonic experience of healthcare? Where the stress levels tend to rise, where there's alarm fatigue that's happening. What if instead of this, we had an opportunity to hear this? There's a hospital in Hove, England, Montefiore Hospital. They worked with Brian Eno. And Brian created two different sound and light installations. What you're hearing now is a piece that was called Quiet Room. And it was in a space where technicians and patients, families could go to be quiet, to relax, to think. He also created another piece that actually sits in the waiting area, the reception area of the hospital, called 77 Million Portraits of Montefiore. And this gives you a whole new experience of healthcare. Think about that. I wonder if one day physicians aren't just prescribing drugs, maybe they're prescribing playlists. So, by sharing some of these examples, I hope that I've kind of opened your eyes and perhaps your ears to the power of sound to change your perceptions and influence your behavior. And so this is my challenge to you in Music City. To everyone who's here, the thinkers, the dreamers, the scientists, the healthcare professionals, the city planners, the technicians, the entertainers, Let's go a little Matt Damon on this, shall we? And science the sonic crap out of it. <laughs> we have the power to use sound to improve our world. So let's do it. That would be music to my ears. Thank you. <laughs>